Once again, this Sunday, we look at a question arising from the text of Scripture in the series, How Does a Weary World Rejoice? The question is actually not the one you see in front of you. The question is one that comes from the Gospel of John itself. Who are you? This is the one asked twice in the Gospel of John. So would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. I want you to join me and imagine for a moment that someone comes to the door of your home or perhaps someone comes to your workplace. They have one question they're going to ask you. They arrive at your door or at your desk and they have one question on their minds and in their hearts. The question is, who are you? Who are you? It's not the kind of thing that happens every day that someone shows up and asks you, who are you? So how would you answer that question? You might begin by giving them your name or your job title, but that's not what they're asking, is it? They want to know something more. That's not what the questioner is knocking on your door or standing over your cubicle wondering. They don't want to know that. They're not interested in what you do or what your name is. So they keep pursuing. Their question comes back again. Who are you? They're going deeper. They really want to know, who are you? What do you say about yourself, comes the second question. The two questions together are penetrating. What do you say about yourself? At the root, at the core of who you are, what do you say about yourself? This is the question asked in the Gospel of John today. Both questions. Who are you? It's directed at John the Baptist. Now, there are many things that we would answer if we were asked about John the Baptist. We might say, well, that's easy. John's kind of a wild man. He eats bugs. He eats honey. He baptizes everybody. He's a messenger of God. He wants everybody to repent and turn their lives around. John is a forerunner. You all know what a forerunner is. This is the one who runs before. <laughs> so, a forerunner, as John is, is the person that comes before, in this case, before Jesus. He's announcing his arrival. He's baptizing with water, as he says, not with the Holy Spirit. The one who will come after him will do that. He is a herald. He is a harbinger. He is the predecessor. Very interestingly, he also reveals something else in this passage that shouldn't be lost on any of us. He says, you're asking me these questions, but the one who is coming is right here, standing among you, and you have no idea who he is. Most important of all in the words we find in John 1, 6 is that John is a witness to the light. John is a witness to the light. I'm going to come back to this in a second. But how does John answer when cornered by the question, who are you? What do you say about yourself? He says, what? I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. John came as a witness in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. He was there to testify to the light. He used his voice to cry out. He used a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He was not concerned about his own agenda, although clearly John knew exactly what he believed was right and what was wrong. If you don't believe me, read the other three Gospels. John was really concerned that people would see the light of God coming into the world. He was like a neon sign on a desert highway in the middle of the night. He's right here. This is the one. John stood in the darkness of his time pointing to the light. John wanted everyone who had been created in the image of God, which means everyone ever created in the image of God, which is all in human history, if you will, every star in the sky full of God's children. He wanted everyone to see God's goodness. He wanted everyone to see that the light was right in front of their eyes. Now, John was clear. 
he was clear that he himself was neither the Messiah nor the elusive prophet Elijah nor any prophet at all. He was embarrassed, in fact, by these questions. He was not even worthy to tie the thong of the sandal of the light. Even though he arrived like thunder in the desert, it was Jesus who would later open the book of the prophet Isaiah, unroll the scroll in the synagogue of his hometown, and read these words that you just heard with truth and with authority. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It was Jesus who was the promise. It was Jesus who was the promise given to all the nations. It was Jesus who would fulfill Isaiah's prophecy. He would come to build up the ancient ruins, to repair the former devastations, to bring the ruined cities back together. It still is Jesus. It is Jesus that we need more than ever before on this planet, in which darkness too often blows out the light in our times. Although John's Gospel lesson focuses on John the Baptist's arrival proclaiming our light of God is coming, I cannot help but wonder about the designer and the choices that God has made about this super light of Jesus. I have so many questions about the light and our relationship to him. Here's the first one, which I better warn you is packed with semicolons and commas. So it's a long question, but at the end you'll hear the question mark. Hang in there. So here it is. How is it that our God, who created the universe, the earth, all the stars, the swirling clouds of hydrogen gas that together tie the solar system together, the billions of planets and billions of galaxies, our God, who imagined, created, and breathed design and color of light and life into everything else in all the universe and called it good. How is it that our God would see to it to bring all of these intricate patterns of the universe into a bundle of human life and light and then place this bundle in the womb of a woman and call her beloved and call him wonderful counselor everlasting father prince of peace there's the question mark how is it how could this be how could we be so blessed to receive such a light in our lives moreover how could we ever miss this blessing how could we turn away and laugh it off or shrug it off how could we whom god also created in god's image and in whom God has also placed light. Ignore it. Pretend that the super light never existed or never came. How could we, a sky full of children, God's stars in this infinite universe whom God has created to adore this light, how could we miss the dance, the song, the breath, the delightful smile, the healing word, the hopeful presence? How could we miss the peace he brings. How could we not see and respond to the love that is there in the womb of a teenager from Nazareth in whom the universe took form and for whom the ancient stars found new light and the ancient harmonies sound, found sound of a new voice and the angels of glory clapped their hands with joy. How could we miss this? How could anyone on this planet miss this when we find and look out on a beautiful universe full of sister planets spinning 600 light years or 22 million calendar years away, how could we miss that Jesus is the super light of our lives and of the universe? From the vast and distant beauty of the earth, I want to suggest something to you this week about light and love and life. I believe that the same light of God, which came into being at the foundation of the universe and found a place to shine from a feed trough in Bethlehem, 
2,023 years ago can be found shining in each and every one of us. I believe that our God who loves us so much that God would give us a super light shine in the person of Jesus Christ also shines on us and in us and through us to others. I believe that each of us is created in the image of God. And that's not a belief I just thought of myself, right? It says it in the first words of Scripture. Each of us is a star in the sky full of God's children. So when I'm asked, who am I? I am a light of God shining in the world. And who are you? You are a light of God shining in the world. We are all the light of God shining in this world. As stars in the universe of God's creative design, how could we live in a way that supports anything but light shine in ourselves and in others. One of the light shining inspirations of our times is Brene Brown. Now, some of you know her writing, some of you love her writing, and maybe like me, some of you are addicted to her videos. <laughs> she's, she's amazing. She says uh, in one of her videos I was watching the other day, there's two things I can promise you about myself is that I cuss and I pray. <laughs> so. Uh, what's not the love? <laughs> so, she shines light on how we can healthfully interact with ourselves and with one another and be active in transforming relationships. There's a wonderful inventory she's created. She calls it braving. Some of you may know this. Her focus is on how we build trust with others. There are seven elements to her inventory. They allow for support, for light shining in the world and in our relationships. In a nutshell, they are as follows. Begins with boundaries. Setting boundaries is making clear what's okay and what's not okay and why. Then reliability. You do what you say you'll do. At work, this means staying aware of your competencies and limitations so you don't overpromise and are able to deliver on commitments and balance competing priorities. Then there's accountability. You own your mistakes. You apologize. You make amends. Then there's vault, right in the middle. Vault, I love this one. You don't share information or experiences that are not yours to share. I need to know that my confidences are kept and you, that you're not sharing any information with me that other people should be holding for themselves as confidential. Then integrity, choosing courage over comfort, choosing what's right over what's fun, fast, and easy, and practicing your values, not just professing them. Then non-judgment. I can ask what I need, and you can ask for what you need, and we can talk about how it feels without judgment. And finally, generosity, extending the most generous interpretation to the intentions, words, and actions of others. Those are wonderful ways to put together light shine in this world. Braving is an example of how we can work together and how we shine light both receiving and giving light for each other in each other's lives. Returning to the beginning, I ask again as I close, as our passage did at the beginning, who are you? Perhaps like John, each one of us can answer, I am a witness to the light. We who are able to discover light and planetary brilliance spinning far outside our solar system are also capable of nurturing, protecting, and supporting the light shining inside ourselves and one another. If we are able to make peace, find peace, and be peace in this world and in this universe which God has created, then each of us will show that as a blessing as those who follow the super light of the word in our lives. Jesus Christ, the super light of the world came to us as a newborn baby, one who was wholly human and wholly divine, as the hymn we just sang lifted up, to show us what it means to be created in the image of God. Braving whatever it is that stands between us and our healing and our wholeness, may each one of us invite the super light of the world into our hearts, into our lives, 
and into our homes this Christmas. So if somebody comes knocking at the door, you will know the answer. I am light shine. As he has shined on me, I shine on others. And may his light shine on you and in you and through you to others. And may the light within each of us always shine bright. Amen.